book of Genesis. We're going to be reading or studying chapters 23 and 24 and 25. You can turn there. Um, as we start this morning, we're actually going to read a few verses from Genesis 25, verses 5 through 8. That's where we're going to start. Then we're going to go back and talk some more about the preceding two chapters. But while you're finding that in your Bibles, I want to let you know what to expect in the next uh, several weeks here at Little Church. My family and I are going on vacation, not this week, but next week. And so we're going to be out for two Sundays. Next Sunday, Little Church will be hosting our, our friend Kareem Smith. He's going to be here delivering the message. Kareem, you remember, uh, had been the, the church, uh, church relations guy at Human Coalition, which is now Health for Her in Cleveland, a pregnancy, uh, crisis pregnancy center. Now he's a pastor at a church over on the west side, but he's agreed to come and fill the pulpit next Sunday. And so we know that you will welcome him uh, next week. And then uh, the following week, June 12th, we're going to hear from Tom Wojnarowski. He's going to preach for us again. And so I know you'll be excited uh, to hear both of them next week and the week after. And then we'll be back on the 19th, which I think is Father's Day. Yeah, is that right? Does that sound right? And then, uh, and then actually the week after that, the last Sunday in June, we're going to be hosting our missionaries, Clark and Mary Aspinwall. They are missionaries to the Brew people in Thailand. They'll be here to present a report on their church planting and Bible translation work. And then Clark's actually going to be delivering the message for us on that Sunday. So I'm actually only preaching once in June. Um, um, I trust that you know, my salary isn't prorated by sermon, right? It's not, I, have to, I have to double check my contract, I guess. But uh, That's just to give you some, some insight into what's happening in the next several weeks here at Little Church. So be in prayer for those services. Today, though, we are back in Genesis 23, 24, and 25. So let's, let's get into it a little bit this morning. I'm going to read verses 5 through 8. I'm going to put the words up here on the screen. Here's what it says. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together again this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Genesis and the, uh, the anchor that it gives us in history and in the world, and the ability that it gives us to understand what your plan is, what you've been doing in the world from the very beginning. And I pray that you would give us more insight into that truth today. By your Holy Spirit, illuminate our hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. What is wrong with the world? We spent time praying this morning and, and remembering before God some of the news headlines, some of the terrible things that we see in the news. We're remembering school shootings, massacres, and wars, and diseases, and violence, and pain, and suffering. What's wrong with the world? What is God doing in the world? It's a question that we have to ask, yeah? And we can take a step back from that, uh, from, from, the, from the news headlines that we see today, and ask the same question just about the world in, in, in terms of history. You know, we can look back through history. You know, what we're seeing in the world today is not terribly different than what's been happening all through history. So we see hurt and suffering and violence and pain and hardship all through world history. And so we can ask the question even more broadly than just what's going on right now in the world. We can ask, what is God doing in history? What is God doing in the world? And that's a helpful question to ask. And I think that's one of the, one of the great benefits that comes from looking at a book like Genesis is because it gives us it gives us a view on the big picture. It, it helps us to, to take a step back. It helps us to zoom out and see what God is doing in the world in history. And so as we look at these chapters in Genesis this morning, what we're going to be seeing is that God is working tirelessly throughout history to bring about the coming of his kingdom and the rule of his king, Jesus Christ. We've been singing about this king this morning, and we will continue to do that. 
God is working tirelessly throughout history to bring about the coming of his kingdom and the rule of his chosen king, Jesus Christ. We've been seeing that in the book of Genesis. We started by seeing how God created the world as his kingdom. He created humans as the representative kings in the kingdom. And even after the fall, even after sin entered the picture, we've been seeing how God has been working to recreate, to, to reinvigorate the kingdom and, and reinstitute the kingship through his chosen redeemer king. That's a promise that God made all the way back in Genesis 3.15, if you remember. Uh, I'll put the words up here on the screen in case you forgot. Genesis 3.15, as God is speaking uh, to the serpent there in the garden, he says these words, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we see in this promise both the fact that there are going to be going forward from this from this point, two groups of people, we've been calling them two families, that's the title of our message today, two families, two families of people, two groups of people who are characterized by different things. One is called the offspring of the serpent and the other is called the offspring of the woman, the family of the serpent, the family of the woman, or we could call them the family of God and the family of the world if you wanted. The group of people who are characterized by the following of God and the group of people who are characterized by the course of this world. There's two kinds of people. It's important to note that, that, that in the end, that's how the world is divided. It's not, rep it's not divided into Republican and Democrat. It's not divided into one race or another. It's not divided by economic status. It's not divided by Americans and everyone else. It's not even divided by Jew and Gentile, as some early Christians mistakenly thought. It's divided into these two groups, those who are the followers of God, and those who are the followers of the course of this world. Those who are in submission to God and those who are in rebellion against God. Two families. And we see that characterized here in this, in this early promise, right from the very beginning. I will put enmity between your offspring and hers. And so in a sense, as we look back at, at world history, that's what we see. We see a history of this conflict between these two groups of people. But this verse also promises something else, doesn't it? It promises that there will someday come one individual who will be the offspring of the woman. One individual who would come in that family of God, the family of the woman, who would do final battle against the serpent. Notice how the verse ends. It says, he will bruise your head. He will crush your head. It's no longer talking about a, a corporate group. It's talking about one individual. There's one person coming, God says, who will crush the head of the serpent. And that, we understand, points forward then to that redeemer king who would come who we understand from the rest of Scripture to be, spoiler alert, Jesus Christ. Right? It's no secret. We understand this from the rest of Scripture, from the Gospel. And so that's what we've been seeing going forward throughout the book of Genesis, how God is, is bringing all of this slowly, slowly to fruition. He's advancing the kingdom. He's advancing the, 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 the family of the woman to that point where eventually the world would be ready for the advent of that king that final offspring of the woman, Jesus Christ. And that brings us back then to our main idea. God is working tirelessly throughout history to bring about the coming of his kingdom and the rule of his king, Jesus Christ. So this morning as we look at Genesis 23 and 24 and 25, we're going to talk about how the kingdom is foreshadowed. In these verses, we're going to talk about the kingdom being advanced and continued. And then as we wrap things up this morning, we will talk about how the kingdom is finally realized through the reign of Jesus Christ. To see the kingdom foreshadowed, look at Genesis chapter 23. We're just going to look at the first few verses of it. Genesis chapter 23. Look at what it says. Sarah lived 127 years. Sarah, you remember, the wife of Abraham, lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Here we see the death of Sarah, the, the, the wife of Abraham, who we've been seeing in the past several weeks, Abraham and Sarah together. We see her, her death. And more than that, we see Abraham preparing to bury her. 
And the rest of chapter 23 goes through the, the story of how, how Abraham has this extended uh, negotiation with some of the Hittites. Those are the, the inhabitants of the land where he's living. And he eventually buys a field that has a cave in it. If you're interested in it, you can read chapter 23 later this afternoon. It's actually a really great example of, uh, of, of the kind of very formal, polite honor shame negotiations that happened in Eastern culture. It's, it's interesting for that purpose. We're not going to spend time reading through it this morning, though. The point is, Abraham buys a field and a cave so that he can bury his wife, Sarah. And we have to ask the question then, why does Moses, the author of Genesis, why does he find it important to include this detail here in the story of Abraham? Why is it important to us that Abraham is going out of his way to, to buy this field and cave so that he can bury his wife who's died? I think it, it serves to demonstrate a couple of things. First of all, this story serves to remind us that Abraham, although he has trusted God, and followed God away from his own homeland into this promised land. He's trusted God all these years, yet still he owns nothing until this moment. This is the first land that he now owns in the land that God has promised him. Up until this point, God has said, I'm going to give you this land. Everything you see is going to be yours. I'm going to give it to you, to your descendants. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. But so far, Abraham's got nothing in terms of land, right, until this very moment. He is, as he identifies himself to the Hittites here, he is a sojourner and a foreigner. He is an immigrant. In fact, it is Abraham's status as an immigrant in the land that becomes the basis for part of the law later on that Moses is going to give to the children of Israel where he says, you guys better treat immigrants well because your fathers were immigrants. Remind yourself regularly that you are an Aramean immigrant. It's a good lesson, I think, for all of us. So this is the first thing that it reminds us, that Abraham, though he has trusted God, still hasn't received what was promised. It's what we read in Hebrews at the beginning of our service, right? These died in faith, not receiving what was promised. But second, this story serves to demonstrate once again that Abraham believes God's promise. He believes that this land will eventually be given to his descendants. And so he invests in it, right? He buys this field and this cave so that his wife's bones and his bones eventually can be buried there because he believes what God has said, that this land would be given to his descendants. Despite all appearances to the contrary, despite the fact that they don't have anything of their own in the land, he says, I believe that what God said is true, and I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, I'm going to buy this land and believe that my descendants are going to be here for the long haul. There's an application point, I think, here for us. It has to do with how we invest our resources. Do we invest in God's promises or not? We could spend time this morning talking about this in terms of money. And maybe we should, maybe we should take a moment and talk in terms of money. We don't, it, it's been pointed out to me that we don't spend a lot of time at Little Church talking about money. Right, uh, I, I think probably one of the reasons for that is that as somebody who takes a living from the church, it's deeply uncomfortable to me to talk about money. It is. And yet we realize that money is important, isn't it? What we do with our money says something about what we believe and where our trust is and where our hope is. And so one of the things that, that we say, I think, fairly frequently here from the pulpit is that when you're visiting with us, we don't expect you to put anything in our offering plate. We're always just glad that you're here. But if you're somebody who is fed regularly at this spiritual table, then we absolutely expect you to put something in the offering plate. Absolutely. We don't do uh, pledges, you know, we don't do faith promise giving or anything like that, but we trust that God will work in your heart and you'll know how to give based on how God has prospered you. That's the New Testament example. But more than that, we expect you not just to give money. We expect you to invest your more valuable resources, too. We expect you to invest time. We expect you to invest passion and energy in the kingdom. Why? Is it because we said so? Is it because we, as the leadership of the church, have crafted programs and we expect you to get in line, get on the bandwagon? No. But it's because as a church, we're trying to focus on discipleship, discipling people. That is our job as this outpost of the kingdom. And so as you invest in the kingdom, 
You're going to be using your resources. Yes, money, but also time and energy in the programs of the church that are designed towards discipling people, helping people be good subjects of the kingdom, helping one another grow as we seek to serve the king. We want you to invest in the kingdom in this way. We want you to invest time and money. We want you to invest your hope in the kingdom. That's a whole other subject, isn't it? Investing your hope in the kingdom. It's so easy to invest our hope in the things of this world, isn't it? It's easy to invest our hope in the next weekend or the next vacation or our retirement or our, or our family or our friends, or the things that are tangible and easy to, easy to grasp, easy to wrap our minds around in this world, it's easy to invest our hope in those things which yield more immediate rewards. But the scripture tells us, don't invest your hope there. Invest your hope in God's promise. That's what Abraham's doing here. He's investing his hope in what God has promised. God's promise that his descendants will outnumber the stars in the sky. God's promise that his descendants will possess the land and and here he's investing his hope and his resources there. Where do you invest your hope? What are you hoping in this morning? Do you prioritize what God prioritizes? Namely, the kingdom. God is working tirelessly throughout history to bring about the coming of the kingdom and the advent of his king, Jesus Christ. So we see the kingdom foreshadowed here in the death and the burial of Sarah, the wife of Abraham. We see the kingdom advanced in the procurement of a wife for Isaac, and we see this in chapter 24 of Genesis. Chapter 24 is a long one, and again, we're not going to spend time reading the whole chapter, but I want to read the first few verses to get you a flavor of what's happening in this chapter. Look at Genesis chapter 24 and see how the story progresses. It says, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge over all he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. And so the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Abraham insists that his son not be taken away from their promised inheritance. Again, he's investing, he's investing everything in the fulfillment of God's promise. Whatever you do, Abraham says to the servant, don't take Isaac back there. That's not what God has promised to my descendants. This is what God has promised to my descendants. Stay here. We're trusting God's promise. The story progresses from there. Maybe you're familiar with the story, maybe you're not, but, but in, in, the general outline of the story is that the servant goes to, to the land where Abraham came from and, and, he, and he prays to God and he says, God, if, if it's your will, then, then allow a woman to come and, and offer water to me and to my camels. And, and, and if she does, that's going to be the woman who you've designed for my master's son, Isaac. And then that's exactly what happens. And, 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 and you see this throughout the rest of chapter 24. You see God being being deeply merciful, deeply gracious to this servant of Abraham's who goes on this errand that Abraham has sent him on. And he finds a wife, and her name is Rebecca, and, and the servant goes and has a conversation with her family, and Rebecca herself is consulted on the matter, which incidentally was not a, a foregone conclusion in that culture, but in this situation, that's exactly what happens. They ask her, do you want to go with this guy, or, or not so much? And she says, yeah, yeah, why not? I've got nothing better to do tonight. And so she goes with him, and they travel back to the promised land. And then if you go, if you fast forward through the end of chapter to the end of chapter 24. Just look how, how the story kind of concludes itself here. Pick up the story in verse 63. Genesis 24, verse 63. Isaac, 
the son of Abraham, went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming, and Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, that is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. What we see is God furthering his kingdom purposes. The family of the woman, the family of God, which again in Moses' retelling of this story is narrowed down to the family of Abraham, must continue to grow, must continue on and and, and on. It must continue to exist in order for God's promise in Genesis 3.15 to come to fruition. So, Isaac has to be married, Isaac has to have children, and Abraham forbids it to be a wife from among the Canaanites because they were pagans, and so Rebekah is provided by divine guidance for Isaac. Notice also, by the way, the, the, the recurring motif here of, of those in the east from those in, in coming from the east. It's one of those minor themes that we've been studying in the book of Genesis where, you know, when, when Adam and Eve left the garden, they, they left the Garden of Eden toward the east and, and, uh, and Cain settled in, in Nod, east of Eden, and the, the builders of the Tower of Babel were traveling around in the east. Abraham comes from the east, Ur, to the promised land, and, and he sends and brings Rebekah now from the east. And again, the point is not that there's anything good or bad, east or west, that's not the point. The point is just the, the symbolism, the motif that's existing here. It's saying there's, there's the family of those who follow God's leading. And they're the family of those who maintain the course of the world and are in rebellion against God. Right? So this is just furthering the same idea of these two families. Just as God provides a wife for Isaac advancing his kingdom purposes, so he provides for each of us spiritually as well. And he does it in, our, in his own way. Humanly, humanly speaking, it would have been much easier, right, for Abraham to find a wife for Isaac from there, in the promised land, from among the Canaanites. That's what Abraham's older son Ishmael does. He finds wives for himself from among the Canaanites and Egyptians and things. It doesn't go all the way back to Mesopotamia, where Abraham sends the servant to get a wife for Isaac. But God has his own purposes. And it's clear throughout chapter 24 that it is God directing this process. God advances his kingdom in his way. We must simply be faithful to his kingdom principles. God is working tirelessly throughout history to bring about the coming of his kingdom and the rule of his chosen king, Jesus Christ. The kingdom is foreshadowed and advanced. And in chapter 25, we see the kingdom continued in the continuation of the family of the woman. In these verses where we started this morning, we see Abraham now dying in Genesis chapter 25. Verses 5 and 6, he gives gifts. In chapter 7, or in verses 7 and 8, Abraham dies, and he eventually is buried in the same cave that he had purchased for the burial of his wife, Sarah. And so the family of the woman is further narrowed down from Abraham to Isaac, And as the chapter continues, it's narrowed down from Isaac to Isaac's sons. Let's pick up the story in verse 19. Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Sound familiar? And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is it happening to me? And so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. And when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, and so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, and so his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. How is the promise of God progressing so far? Do you remember what God's promise to Abraham was? 
Your descendants are going to be like the stars in the heavens, dust on the earth, the sand on the seashore. So far, we see Abraham with only one child of, of promise. He, he has other children. There's, there's his older son Ishmael, and then you know, the beginning of chapter 25 tells us that he married somebody after Sarah and had other sons. But, but there's only one son who's part of this promise. Isaac, maybe we expect things to, to multiply from here, but Isaac, first of all, has to ask God to enable his wife to conceive. And then when she does, we only learn about two children who are born, twins, fraternal, apparently, Isaac, uh, Esau, and Jacob. It seems like the promise of God to multiply Abraham's offspring is getting off to a particularly slow start, isn't it? Esau and Jacob are the sons of Isaac. And as the story progresses, one of the things we learn is that even among these two, God has chosen one, not both, only one. The promise is going to go through one of them. And it's not the one who everybody would have thought. It's not going to be the older son, just as it wasn't the older son of Abraham, Ishmael, who is chosen by God, but a younger son. So here, it is not the older son, Esau, who is chosen, but it's the younger son, Jacob. And this is, is demonstrated for us in the story that rounds out chapter 25. Pick it up in verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore is his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. From our perspective, this may not seem like a big deal. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a big deal. It's an odd story, isn't it? And after all, what is a birthright and who cares about it? which was kind of Esau's whole attitude towards the whole thing. But, but remember what a birthright was in this culture. The birthright was the, the inheritance. The birthright was your claim to the inheritance. And what's happening in the story is that Esau, the older son, the one who by human right has the right to the inheritance, is looking around and saying, what inheritance? They own a field that has a cave and some skeletons. That's the inheritance. And Esau is looking at it and he's going, what's the point? I'm hungry now. Right? Kind of sounds like a little kid, doesn't he? I'm about to die. But Jacob, Jacob looks around and he says, I know. I know that it's just a field right now. I know that right now it's just a field with a cave in it with some bones. But I also know that God has made a promise. I also know that God promised Grandpa that we're going to have all of it. I know that God promised that there's going to be a great nation someday. I know that God promised that he's going to bless those who, who bless us, and the one who dishonors us, he's going to curse. The point of the story, as Moses tells it to us, and as he tells it to the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness, is to show that Jacob, for all of his faults that we're going to see in coming chapters, Jacob here is the one exercising faith. Jacob here is the one believing God's promise, and Esau is the one despising it. Okay. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Jacob's a, 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 a sterling example of a faithful man of God. He's a, he's a scoundrel, and that's going to be made obvious in later chapters, and we're going to see that. But the point here is, what family do they belong to? What family does Jacob belong to? What family does Esau belong to? Clearly, Moses is telling us Esau belongs to the family of the serpent. He's following the course of this world. He's guided by his appetites and not by trust in God's promise. But Jacob thinks there's something more here. What family are you a part of? Interestingly, this narrowing down of the family of the woman to the line of Jacob rather than the line of Esau, is picked up as a chief piece of evidence of God's sovereignty in the New Testament. So, commenting on this revelation that God makes to Rebekah in chapter 25, verse 23, where he says, the older shall serve the younger, Paul, in Romans 9, 
writes this. This is Romans 9, 10, 11, and 12, if you want to check it out later. He says this, Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the older will serve the younger. And we have to avoid two mistakes here. First, we have to avoid the mistake of trying to explain God's decision as a function of Esau's choice. It's not just that God looks forward into history and sees what Esau is going to do and therefore chooses Jacob on the basis of Esau's act. Romans doesn't let us understand it that way. Paul insists that what happens in history is a result of God saying, the older will serve the younger. That's the whole point of Romans 9. Now it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this idea, I, I grant you. But I challenge you to read Romans 9, 10, and 11 and arrive at another conclusion. So we have to avoid, on the one hand, the mistake, the error of saying that God's decision is a function of Esau's choice. But on the other hand, we also have to avoid the mistake of trying to vindicate Esau by saying that he was the unwilling victim of God's will and had no choice in his actions, as though he were a puppet on a string. That's clearly not true either, is it? Esau chose Esau made a decision, and his decision was to despise his birthright. His decision was to despise God's promise, and he's held accountable for that choice. The lesson to be learned here is not simply that God ordains our response to his kingdom, but that since God ordains it, we would do well to take the matter very seriously. Or, to put it in, in biblical terms, don't be like Esau. The author to the Hebrews says it this way, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it be, many become defiled. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Don't be like Esau. Nor should you look at these things and say, God does what he will, so who finds fault? Paul, Paul dismisses that as absurd. Who are you to respond back to God? No, friends. It's because God acts in history as he does that you have motivation to think about these things and take them deeply, seriously. Since God has so ordained history to bring about the coming of his kingdom, we would be foolish to ignore that kingdom and the king who inaugurates it, Jesus Christ. God is working tirelessly throughout history to bring about the coming of this kingdom and the rule of this king, Jesus. This kingdom, which is foreshadowed and advanced and continued in these chapters of Genesis, is not realized in the life of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or any of the patriarchs. Indeed, in some sense, it hasn't even been entirely realized yet. And yet we see it begin to be realized in the coming of Jesus Christ. All of these things that happen in Genesis and all the things that happen in the rest of the Old Testament are brought about in order to prepare the way for this Messiah, for this Redeemer King. Jesus Christ is the ultimate seed of the woman, the ultimate offspring of the woman who crushes the head of the serpent. Jesus is the one who fully trusted in God, not just, not just traveling from the east to the promised land, but traveling from heaven to earth. Jesus is the one who did battle with the serpent and seemed to be defeated as he died on the cross and was buried in a cave in the promised land, like Abraham and Sarah. And three days later, he rose from the dead, showing his victory over the serpent, showing his victory over sin and over death. Jesus is the one who, after for after being alive after his death and resurrection, walking the earth for 40 days, ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, the throne of heaven, and is there now. I feel like it's so easy to say those words and so hard to really realize them. Do you understand? Jesus is currently sitting on the throne of the universe. Do me a favor, put your hand on the, on the pew 
beside you. Feel, feel it, touch it. It's real, yeah? It's real, it's there. You're real, you're here. Jesus is just as real and just as literally sitting on the throne of God right now. And he's coming back, and he's going to establish on this earth the kingdom that is promised in Genesis 3.15, the kingdom that is hinted at in the Abrahamic covenant in in, in Genesis 12, the kingdom that Abraham believed in when he laid down the money and bought the field in Canaan. Jesus is coming back. He is returning to establish this kingdom of God on earth. And so the question for us is, do you belong to the kingdom? Do you belong to the family of God? Do you, do you belong to the family of the woman? Or do you belong to the family of the world? The family of the serpent? Are you one of those who is following the Lord? Or are you one of those who is following the course of this world? Are you submitting to the Lord? Or are you, or are you in rebellion against the Lord? God is working tirelessly through history to bring about the coming of this kingdom The ultimate storyline of life is God's kingdom ruled by God's king. All else is prelude and subplot. It is the kingdom that matters. We engage in the ultimate truth through accepting Christ's salvation. And so, as we wrap things up this morning, my my exhortation to you is that if you've never done this before, that you accept Christ's salvation today. That you join yourself to this kingdom now. That you repent and trust Christ. For you, brother and sister Christian, I say the same thing. Continue in repentance and continue in faith. Take a few minutes in silent reflection and prayer. Take a few moments in thanksgiving to God for his sovereign ordination of all history to bring about his desired ends, the kingdom and the rule of Jesus Christ. Recommit yourself this morning to a life of ongoing repentance and ongoing trust in this Redeemer King. And in just a moment, we are again going to worship the King who was given for us, Jesus Christ.